Welcome back to the channel Russia in Context. I'm Wyatt, and today we're exploring Russian news you may have missed. Now, it's been two and a half months since the last time I've done a video like this, so there is a lot of ground to cover. Buckle up, we've got no time to waste. First off is news from late February about legislation which allows the Russian government to classify any statistic that they feel is important to hide for security reasons. It's honestly a surprise they didn't think of this earlier, but they've certainly wasted no time putting it to use, as currently a third of Russia's budget is undisclosed. And at the end of April, the government announced that it would be classifying all statistics related to oil and gas industry for an entire year. Now, this comes on the heels of earlier legislation, which allows government officials to not openly report their income and assets, meaning money goes into the system and then just basically disappears, no accountability necessary. In fact, on the topic of officials hiding their earnings, we just got a taste of what that looks like at the end of April. The St. Petersburg City Council published their income reports. Instead of using people's names, the list was just official number one, official number two, official number three, so on and so forth. So not only do we have any idea of the actual amounts, that the deputies and other government officials earn and own, uh, we actually have no idea who they are in the lists. In March, Chinese President Xi Jinping paid a visit to Moscow, a momentous occasion which stopped the city in its tracks. Literally. The city was paralyzed with traffic because anytime he and Putin had to go somewhere for discussions, they closed like half the streets in the city. Now, nothing earth-shattering came as a result of the trip, but the Octagon Media Group later reported that negotiations took place between Moscow and Beijing for the latter to implement a Russian version of the Great Chinese Firewall. This would effectively isolate the Russian internet from the rest of the world, something the government has been attempting to do since spring of last year. Now, some of the first major websites to get blocked were Facebook and Instagram, which were labeled extremist by the Russian government. Later, news sites such as BBC were also deemed dangerous when their reporting directly conflicted with the Kremlin-approved narrative. Even seemingly innocuous websites such as SoundCloud, uh, which allows musicians a place to upload their tracks and share their work, they have become non grata in Russian digital space for their open support of Ukraine. However, there's been one glaring exception to Moscow's intolerance to all independent media not under their control, YouTube. There are a few reasons this might be the case. The first is that there are many pro-Kremlin outlets and content creators still uploading to the site in both Russian and English, and that by blocking off YouTube, they would be cutting access to a portion of the online audience that they could potentially influence an audience that is growing all the time as people are turning off their televisions, especially younger generations. The other major issue is that the state-controlled Rutube, which has been owned by Gazprom since 2020 and is one of the supposed replacements of YouTube here in Russia, still only has around a million views per day and only 50 million visitors per month. Numbers which pale in comparison to YouTube's 7 billion views per day, and 35 million daily visitors. Daily. Lastly, if they cut out YouTube too soon, it might drive more people to VPN usage, which would ultimately negate any censorship the government had been attempting to achieve. Now, this might have been an easy story to write off as more paranoid rumors making the rounds, but when Vkontaktia, the Kremlin-controlled Russian Facebook knockoff, began to vastly and quickly improve their ability to host video, it caused most to take a second look. Part of this expansion of contact is likely in connection to TikTok blocking video uploads from Russia about a year ago, at which time Vkontakte launched their own short-form video platform. But the fact that there has been more and more investment in bulking up these services does lend some credence to the possibility that the Russian government's endgame is an internet more akin to what China or North Korea have. Oh, I almost forgot. 
When I saw this, even though it's not at all important, I knew I had to share it. On the state-controlled nightly news program in the southern Ural region, at the beginning of February, they aired a story from the Chelyabinsk Oblast, which reads like something people would imagine if they wanted to stereotype Russia as an underdeveloped country with a high percentage of people just barely scraping by. One frigid January night in a small village, a communal outhouse built for the local medical clinic mysteriously disappeared. Who would steal a wooden outhouse, and why, you might ask? Well, a local unemployed man did so in order to use it for kindling in his oven to heat his home. Now, within two days, the home was again without heat. The absurdity of the situation would make it funny if it weren't so damn depressing, and I still don't understand why this made the news. Maybe the name of the village, Novokrainsky, had something to do with it. Still, for a propaganda machine that for years has delightfully crowed about how the West is unable to afford its citizens the most basic of necessities, this is simply too ironic, and I'm not sure why it's even still up online. You can literally go watch it after this video. Now, turning to more recent events, one of the biggest in early April to blow up the news feed here in Russia was the murder of Vladlen Tatarsky, a war correspondent. He was killed by an explosive hidden away in a bus gifted to him at a gathering at a cafe in St. Petersburg. It killed him and injured 25 others when it went off. Tatarsky gained widespread notoriety for these comments made at the Kremlin's annexation ceremony in the autumn. Now, a month since the attack, much like has happened after the death of Daria Dugna, he has largely been forgotten as he was never more than a peripheral figure in the public consciousness. At the end of April, Putin made an unexpected trip to the front lines. The Russian press hyped up the event, evidently relieved to have their leader finally make a PR-worthy appearance in the quagmire he initiated after months of Zelensky managing similar visits to more dangerous locations. One of the clips from the trip was of Putin meeting with officers and presenting them with a historical icon. However, people soon began to question the authenticity of the Kremlin's narrative when it was noted that Putin mentioned Easter would be soon. And it had, in fact, already occurred a week prior. Dmitry Peskov, Putin's personal spin doctor, explained the faux pas way as Putin, alluding to the 40 days of Easter. Now, this is a thing which doesn't exist as far as I can ascertain. I've never once heard of it in all of my years here, nor could I find any mention of it online. And yes, I realize that in the Eastern Orthodox Church, there is a practice of holding a vigil 40 days after the death of an individual, but that's not what Putin said and it doesn't apply to Easter anyway. So either Putin had himself a Biden moment. But once, every once in a while I make a mistake, not like well, once a speech, but at any rate, I... Which would be delightfully ironic given the Russian press's love of clamoring about it every time it happens to the US president, or Putin visited the frontline region at least a week before the story broke, and then the Kremlin lied to make Putin seem more spontaneous and brave? At any rate, the story quickly disappeared from the news after the icon clip surfaced. Speaking of Peskov, according to Yevgeny Prigozhin, the owner of the Wagner Mercenary Group, and a man who has never once lied about anything, the mustachioed spokesman's son secretly served in an artillery unit for the last half year. The official story is that he used a fake name and documents to sign up so that no one would know who he was, which I'm pretty sure is an offense punishable by jail time. No clear distinct images of the young Peskov actually serving exist. The only evidence is this video of a man with his face hidden behind a balaclava, uh, though this isn't a huge surprise as Russian soldiers are rarely photographed these days without a facial covering of some sort. It's almost as though they're ashamed of their actions or fearful of some form of future retribution. Weird, right? Still, I'd wager that it is Nikolai Peskov there, but there's still plenty of doubt as to the veracity of these claims of him battling away on the front lines, 
especially considering the young Peskov's car received at least one traffic violation while he was up to his waist in mud and shit, as Prigozhin so delightfully described Wagnerian conditions. Now, I thought about including a clip here about the prank call that was made to Peskov's son in the autumn, which sure sounded like him using his father's status to scoff at the idea of military service, but the people who made the video are currently labeled foreign agents and I think terrorists, and I'm sure the whole thing has been classified as fake news, so I'm not going to get into it, but it would maybe help to explain the whole him going to fight thing. Anyway, why would somebody want to lie about this? Or at the very least, why would they suddenly decide to release this video from January now? Well, some have theorized that it's an attempt to sell the concept of enlisting to those who aren't hovering around the definition of poverty. But more likely, it's to placate those very communities. If historically the aristocracy rode into battle among foot soldiers, to foster morale, a PR stunt like this is ostensibly hoping for the same effect, trying to convince the poor that they are not carrying the brunt of the special military operation, that the elites are secretly there among the plebs. But judging by how quickly the story was abandoned, it likely didn't create the resonance that had been hoped for, perhaps even the opposite. On a related note, there has been a massive enlistment advertising campaign around Moscow and I would assume other major cities in the last month, with flyers in like the window of every other store and a good percentage of the billboards sporting this image. The payment being offered is many times more than the average Russian salary and a few times more than the average in Moscow. Now, this is part of the Ministry of Defense's plan to recruit over 500,000 men into the military on contracts most of which would be taking the places of those mobilized in the autumn, according to Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Still, it's springtime in Russia, and the citizens are trying to distance themselves from such news stories by getting outside and enjoying the weather. With clear skies overhead, people typically turn their gazes to the heavens to catch the warming rays of the sun or delight in recognizing shapes in the clouds. This year, they have another reason to keep their eyes attuned upwards. Things seem to be constantly falling to Earth. Just this month, in the city of Belgorod, a warplane decided to fly directly overhead while carrying bombs, and one of them happened to slip out and crash into the street in a residential neighborhood. Well, technically two fell, but no one seemed to realize this until locals located the second explosive embedded in the ground at which point the military released a statement that they had actually lost two. In addition to plummeting munitions, whole planes have been flaming out of existence. Just last week, it happened near Murmansk. And it's not just the Russian Air Force dropping from the skies. The last month has seen a substantial uptick in the sightings of unidentified drones cruising high overhead or the discovery of their wreckage in fields and forests around large population centers. Hey everyone, a quick aside here. Uh, as I was editing the video, news broke that a drone had attacked the Kremlin. Um, obviously that does fit into this news story here, but due to the fact that uh, it's still, details are still coming out, we are going to uh, not include it in this video here, and I will be addressing it in a later video. But um, yes, I just wanted to let everybody know that yes, I am aware of it, but no, I will not be talking about it right here. I now return you to your regularly scheduled program. It would be remiss of me not to mention the drama surrounding Yelena Blinovskaya. Who is this, you may ask? Well, Yelena Blinovskaya is a popular scam artist, I mean, social media personality. Uh, and it came out this last week that she had evaded nearly a billion rubles, or $11.5 million worth of taxes. She was detained at the border with Belarus, attempting to flee the country in a Maybach, must have been bad luck that they just randomly decided to stop such a normal looking vehicle for a routine check. Blinovskaya is currently being held under house arrest, though she did almost immediately after the court proceedings pay the owed amount. I guess she just had it laying around. 
Should we try it later for money laundering? And it's likely other prominent Russian vloggers and influencers are about to feel the heat, as several others have since made payments to the tax authorities. I'll try to make a video, a dedicated video about this in the next, you know, few weeks um, and how all of this kind of connects to Russian society as a whole, uh, but no promises on that one. Turning to news from beyond the Imperial Corps, there is the matter of Novosibirsk losing its ability to elect a mayor. The third largest city in the country was one of the last to still actually have that democratic process intact, but alas, it is no more. It now joins basically every other major metropolitan area and federal region in that the leader is chosen by the city council, which is typically dominated by United Russia, uh, the party of the Kremlin, or by Putin himself. Still, Russians get a vote for Putin once every six years, so that's good enough, right? Wildfires are already picking up across the country, mainly in Siberia. The last weeks have seen villages burned to the ground in parts of Omsk, Tomsk, Urgan, and Sverdlovsk oblasts, as well as Zabaykalsky Krai. Uh, wildfires are an annual problem, typically in the non-European part of Russia, and thanks to changes in the climate, they appear to be growing more frequent and stronger. It remains to be seen how this year will develop, of course, but for so much news on this subject so early in the year, it seems not to bode very well. Lastly, a light little story. The Tuva Republic on the border with Mongolia is one of the most remote regions in Russia, famous for being the birthplace of Shoigu, its extreme poverty, and Buddhism. Recently, in the capital city of Kizil, the largest Buddhist monastery in Russia was opened. It will be able to house monks full-time, six local, and six will come from India, uh, from a Tibetan monastery there. This was by no means all of the news from the last two months, so let me explain why I've conveniently ignored major topics connected to things like the economy, high-profile court proceedings, or legislation around electronic military summons. While putting this video together, I realized that if I tried to touch on all three of these subjects in a meaningful manner, there'd be a problem with the video just being way too long. And as I'm working alone here, it might have just simply not gotten done at all. Therefore, I have decided to break these news stories off into their own special dedicated videos, much like I did well, when discussing foreign agent laws uh, if you haven't checked that video out, you should do that after this one. In the near future, keep your eyes open for videos about what's been going on in the legal system here in Russia and what the new law regarding electronic military summons means in the grand scheme of things. As far as economics is concerned, I know every other channel, even remotely connected to Russia, uh, has done a video on the economy and sanctions. They gloss over so many details, they just ignore so much stuff. And I've decided that in order to actually explore that topic and really get into the nitty gritty of it, I'm gonna have to break it into a series of videos. So I'm gonna be working on that over the coming months. Uh, it will come out slowly, so be patient with me, bear with me, uh, but it is coming. I really wanna do a good job on that because yeah, it's kind of a big topic and I feel like a lot of people have been doing it dirty. As a result of ignoring those three topics I just mentioned, it seems like there hasn't been much happening here in Russia. Um, however, almost all of the news has been connected to those topics or the special military operation, which I shall refrain from commenting on so as to avoid any misinterpretations and potential cries of discreditation. And with that, you're all caught up on news you may have missed from here in Russia. As always, hit the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already, um, write a comment down below if you have any questions about any of the news stories I talked about here. Uh, if you've had any comments, maybe there's some things that you would like to hear more about. Uh, regardless of what it may happen to be, just write it down below in the comments section, right? Questions, comments, name of your cat. I don't care, doesn't matter. I'll respond to it, I love getting it, so always great. So yeah, hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment. As always, I am Wyatt. This has been Russia in Context. Thanks for watching.